I know most of you know me already. I'm Aya Santa Chita. And uh, today, uh, Aya Vimala from Belgium is with us. And uh, um, she's uh, visiting me now at the Aloka Earth Room for a week. And uh, Aya Vimala is from Belgium, and she established a monastery there, the Tilorian Monastery where I stayed uh, in um, 21 in December for a week. And it's a very beautiful place in the countryside. And I'd like to uh, ask Avimala to just uh, introduce herself. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I think I've met all of you, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is uh, Venable Vimala. So I'm uh, from, from Belgium. I have a small monastery there called Tilorian. Uh, and it's in, uh, yeah, it's near a national park. So it's this quite secluded little place. It's just very beautiful, I think. Uh, so yeah, my pronouns are they, them. So I identify as non-binary. And um, yeah, what else can I say? It's like we started the monastery in 2018, sort of actually just finished building. And um, if ever you come to Europe, please come and visit. A very welcome to everyone in Europe. <laughs> so, you know, usually we start the meetings here with the refugees in precept. So Karen, would you like to screen share that in? Well, who is our host, our Zoom host? Tia. Tia, Tia thank you for screen sharing. So, uh, you know, I'm go gonna now chant the Namo Tassa three times and you can all uh, chant along with me. And if everybody's muted, only you, Tia, if you can be also muted. So, and you can just uh, chant with me the Namo Tassa and then we're gonna do the refugees call and response. And for that, Tia, can you unmute yourself? So I have one person online, you know, where I can hear the voice. So you can unmute yourself now. Thank you. That's great. So then we do the refugees call and response and then the precepts as well, call and response, okay? So we start all together with the Namo Tassa, those who would like to join in. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Bhutang Saranangachami Bhutang Saranangachami Tammang Saranangachami Tammang Saranangachami Sankang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Putang Sarananga Chami Dutiyam pitam mang saranangga chami. Dutiyam pandam mang saranangga chami. Dutiyam pisangkang saranangga chami. Satyam pi putang sarananga chami. Satyam pi putang sarananga chami. Satyam pi tamang sarananga chami. Satyam pi saman sarananga chami. Tatiyam pi sankang sarananga chami. Tatiyam pi sankang 
Can you scroll up? I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikapatani samadhyami silena sukatinyanti silena boga sampada silena nipotinyanti tasma silang visotaye. Thank you. So just let's take like a few minutes to really settle in. And if everyone can, uh, you know, mute themselves, please. Did you say unmute? Mute. Oh. Thank you. So I'm handing over to you, Ayavimala. Thank you, Aya. Okay. Well, yesterday, uh, myself and Aya Santuchita we were discussing. It's like, well, what shall we talk about? And somehow we came on this topic of the, uh, our interdependence on the earth. Of course, like... Uh, being in the, the earth room or what's going to be the earth room and the, the topic of um uh yeah the environmental issues that we're we're facing and i told her the story um yet uh, i i used to uh, in a previous life in this life <laughs> i i used to be a, a geophysicist and um my first field work was uh, in an area that's actually very close to where I have the monastery in Belgium nowadays, a bit more uh, downstream from the same river. And um, I still remember that very much because it was, of course, a very exciting thing if you have your field, first field work trip. And um, this was to an area where it was this large, this large area of, of limestone. And um, 
and when we start to reflect on that, it's there's this limestone. It's for millions of years. It's this this reef basically. It's like bigger than the Great Barrier Reef. Um, that was there for millions of years, and then for millions of years, uh, animals lived there and plants lived there, and then died and deposited a very large layer of. Um, of basically of skeletons on the bottom of the sea, which was later compacted and became rock. And then still later on, it was lifted up above the sea level where it is now into this mountainous area. And this river is flowing through that and it slowly dissolves through erosion. It dissolves these, uh, these skeletons and it becomes the calcium in water. And that's our drinking water. That's literally the drinking water that we have at the monastery. Uh, so we're drinking something that contains the skeletons of all these beings. And that becomes part of our own skeleton again. And this is true for all the molecules in our bodies like we we whatever we eat it used to be plants animals and it's just part of this beautiful cycle of life and so we can't see ourselves separate from like that's the earth and the environmental things and this is us right and that's quite often that's how we look at things um and I, 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 I started reflecting on that. And the more you reflect on that, the bigger you see the, you, you, how much you change your perspective on how big that really is. Um, and that one day, our own skeletons will also be part of nature again. Uh, humans have also lived for a few million years and uh, yeah, uh, cemeteries and putting us in boxes where we all contained that that's something that is fairly unnatural and that hasn't is actually very recent development so all these skeletons of all these billions of people that lived before are somewhere in this whole cycle and we are our skeletons are built up also of all these molecules that used to belong to the skeletons of other people that lived on this earth. And our skeletons will go back in that cycle uh, as well at some point. It will, our, all these molecules of our body will be part of the grass that's eaten by animals. And people eat the animals or they drink the milk or uh, eat, eat the plants or, and, all that is just part of this huge cycle. So we can't see ourselves loose from this, this planet and from this whole cycle of life. And it, it's so important to realize that and to contemplate that in our daily life. If you, we had this beautiful Indian meal uh, with some of the people here. And if you look at your plate, you see all this, this beautiful food, but every day you can see like, where does this come from? And it's not just what I've just been saying, but all these people that have been in this whole food chain and all the plants and animals in this whole food chain to build that up. Where does all these ingredients come from? So many ingredients on your plate from all over the world nowadays. And... Um, there's been people in that, that chain, the, the farmers, the people that are in between, um, their parents who have taught them things. And so we're all connected. And that's this also what uh, Thich Nhat Han calls interbeing. We're all connected, all together. And um, if you start seeing that, and it's like, hold on, this is so big and so beautiful in a way and so precious and it's something that we can cherish and we can um we, we can also see that it, it, it's sort of empty of any self it's not like me and the rest of the world it's everything is there connected and without one of these these parts things are we going to be slightly different uh, so it's, it's 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 really beautiful to to every day when you have your meal when you have your breakfast look at your plate and see what's what's there and, and reflect on this and that ha helps you to it, it's um 
it's also a meditation. You could see it as a, a food meditation. <laughs> so if you want to call it that. And, it's, uh, and if you put it in your mouth, and say, hold on. I'm chewing this. How does it taste? All these things that are in there. I'm chewing on that what the world has given me, but also part of this cycle. I'm taking part of this cycle every time. And I heard somewhere that every seven years, your um, uh, your your body changes all the molecules in it. Uh, so yeah, you can say, well, what, what is this I really in there? This this body changes every seven years. It's part of this cycle constantly. So. Yeah, you can reflect on that. See, what is that really? What's going on there? Um, and we'll, uh, in a bit, we'll do a guided meditation also based on this topic. To see, uh, see, to just to, to look inside and see what does, does this feel like. Feeling is very important in meditation. It's not all about thinking. Contemplation has a role. Thinking has a role. But it's all about feeling it as well. Like where do you feel it in your body? For, on your, everything has a resonance in the feelings in your body. So how does that feel? How does it feel to know that you're part of this cycle? And how can you be more in tune with that cycle? Just if you change your view, you change your perspective, your, your, your perception towards these things, also your, your, slowly your way of thinking changes. And with that, your views change. And when your views change, your, your, your perception changes again. Until you've got it really right until it feels right and you don't have to think about it anymore it becomes part of you uh, and that's what I, I find really beautiful about it, these teachings of what we call the three pillars uh the, the, the views perceptions and thoughts and you can always see it's like if you have lots of thoughts about if you're really obsessing about something whatever it is then there's something um, imbalance in that so you can see like Okay, what's happening? I, I'm telling myself a story. And that story is like, you will notice is this gramophone that keeps on going on the same story over and over and over again. And that's when there's some imbalance. And then you can say, so like, okay, wh where is my perception, my view? Where is that not balanced? What am I not willing to see? And it's the same with this connection with the earth. It's like, what are we not quite willing to see yet? How can we look at um, all these things, what is challenging for us? What, what is there that part of me is not comfortable with yet? And why is that? And then we can slowly change that and say, okay, this is how it is. And once you come to that understanding is that we are all part of this cycle, um, you can feel how that feels. And quite often then there's, there's this sort of letting go of like, okay, this is okay. This is actually really beautiful. And yeah, with this comes this, this calm and peace and understanding that you also can take with you in your meditation again. So all these things are all connected. You can't like thinking, thinking is part of that part and meditation is all being calm and quiet on my cushion. All these things have to do with each other. Whatever you do every moment of every day has an impact also in your meditation. So when you sit on your cushion, it is not like an isolated event. It's like, okay, now it's my cushion time. Uh, in, in, in some way, it is like that because you sit down and, and you sit on your cushion. But whatever you do in the day and however you reflect, however you use your mind in the day, if you have love and kindness towards uh, the world, towards everybody in it, towards the plants, the animals, that you bring back into your meditation. And then when you sit down, your mind is calm and quiet. 
when you can really develop this love and kindness. And if you, if you really understand this, this yourself as being part of the cycle of life, that love and kindness comes up automatically because you can understand that whatever you do is going to have an effect somehow. And if you can have love and kindness for that, you also can have love and kindness for yourself because it's all one and the same thing. Now, I wanted to, um, before I give over to, to Ayasanta Chitta, I just wanted to tell a little joke. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. My, one of my teachers is Ajahn Brahm. So uh, if those of you who know Ajahn Brahm, he's always about jokes. <laughs> Usually bad jokes, but okay. Um, so uh, quite quite often uh, we, we think of ourselves as so important uh, on this planet. Uh, but yeah, this, this joke is about that. It's like these two planets, it's the Earth and another planet meet each other in space. And um, this one planet says to the Earth, it's like, you don't look so good. Are, are, are you okay? And the earth said, well, no, I've got homo sapiens. <laughs> and the other plant said, oh, don't worry about it. I had that too. It'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I want to um, give that to, uh, to Ayasan to Tita to talk a little bit more about this subject. Thank you. It's quite funny, yeah. Uh... It's quite funny and also quite kind of, um, you know, uh, it's dangerous for us you know, as a species because, uh, you know, I also wanted to speak about, you know, that, you know, we're always speaking about the, the climate crisis and the environmental crisis, but in reality, it's it's a human crisis, really, because the planet, yeah, he, he or she or it, I don't know how we want to call it, it's like having, you know, having some kind of illness, like a rash or, or maybe dandruff or something like that. And then, uh, you know, there is the, the planet is doing, uh, is, is speaking to us in, in many ways, you know, through the um, droughts and, and wildfires and floods and all of that. You know, we get quite some uh, constant feedback these days and... Uh, we are still not really all interested enough, you know, that we are really making changes according to those feedback loops, you know, which have started to kick in and 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 I think they will more and more um intensify. And uh you know, really realizing it's it's not a really a planetary crisis, but it's a crisis of Homo sapiens, really, who we are as a species, you know, coming to some kind of a threshold, uh, an evolutionary threshold where we can maybe, you know, rise up and evolve or, or not, you know, and that's something which is still, you know, uncertain how it's going to pan out. But what we do know is, you know, over the millions of years since there is homo, some kind of the different kinds of homo on this planet, there have been there have been, you know, thresholds which have been successfully crossed, you know, when fire was tamed for the first time, when when people started to make clothing or building shelter or starting to, um, you know, with agriculture, inventing, riding. I mean, there have been so many huge shifts which have been, uh, you know, successfully implemented and you know the shift we are now facing towards you know is also something which could be achieved again if enough of us show an interest and if enough of us really understand how important it is i think then you know the 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 capacities will be awakened you know because our potential is not completely developed yet you know there's a lot of dormant capacities which are you know lying in our in our biocomputers our bodies and our minds which we can we can choose to awaken those or not and intention is is a very is the most important element here you know to have an intention and to really um cultivate that intention in the heart by you know reflecting on it 
repeatedly and you know also applying practices in order to train our minds so that those potentials can can strengthen slowly i mean that's the way to do it you know and it has been done many times before you know for another example would be you know when the first fish you know came on land for a long long time ago and developed some kind of um, capacities to move on land for example some kind of legs or whatever that was in the beginning that must have been a, a huge struggle and uh, when when uh, you know, apes came down from the trees and started to walk on two legs. That must have been a huge experiment with with lots of uncertainty and lots of fear and lots of, uh, you know, trial and error. But it was also successful because here we are today, you know, walking on two legs, little feet and with shoes and everything, and we can do it. So, you know, what we are facing up now is just not not something which is bigger than what we have already faced uh, several times before so we can we can do this it just needs application and it needs to have an understanding that this is the way forward and i think you know with the feedback we are getting from the planet we we very clearly know what the way forward is it is you know, we have to live simpler lives, which are more locally connected with the earth. And we need to kind of consume less and we need to, you know, produce less plastic products. And we need to, uh, you know, basically cut back on, on CO2 um, emissions. So it's it's pretty clear what needs to be done, but there's still so much uh, confusion in the communication about all of this, and a lot of you know different um, different interests, you know, trying to cancel each other out, and 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 also sowing a lot of confusion. And so, you know, we are still like in the middle of the chaos where things start to the water start to clear slowly and more and more people start to understand yes i mean it's really true there is some big shifts we need to make but it's not something which cannot be done it totally can be done the question is just how to do it and uh, how to organize ourselves because we are like over 8 billion people on this planet and there is a, indeed a, a lot and the planet is is you know basically um nearing a maximum carrying capacity and that's something you know which is scary of course but we can find ways to respond to that and i think uh, you know that's um something which we all need to start to turn towards that and i think especially you know people like us who do have a practice who do understand you know that there are ways to cultivate the mind and to steady the mind and to train the mind so it it stays open and doesn't defend against information which is scary but it allows that information, you know, to come in and to resonate and then to kind of slowly be integrated into our systems by repeated um, application, you know, by repeatedly and especially also, you know, in a group as a collective, repeatedly opening up to this and seeing, you know, what, what, uh, what emerges from that you know if we as a, as a community together face this very difficult truth because i i don't think you know that we as individuals need to kind of uh, come up with the answer because we even couldn't do that but we can as individuals support each other you know to allow that information to land with us as, as a collective and for example, in this meeting in the Dharma Collective here, we are like 
maybe like 25 people all together, you know, some here in person, some online, you know, do not underestimate what that does. You know, if, if a whole group of people together has the courage and also has the understanding how to do it, to allow this very difficult information to land in the middle of us and to just hold that, you know, with a lot of compassion for ourselves and for the whole situation, you know, which is indeed very difficult and unwieldy and unprecedented. But at the same time, I, I'm convinced, you know, it's not dependent on our individual brains to come up with an answer. But I think that if we allow, you know, our individual beings as vessels and our collective vessel to receive that, that the response will become clear. You know, today is a lot of speaking about emergence. And I think, you know, that's another way of speaking about intuition, for example, you know, about, uh, you know, allowing that those facts, you know, to inform us. And the word information means, you know, to open yourself to certain data which then, you know, slowly are uh, informing your being. And and that happens through feeling it. You know, what I, what I was saying before, because that seems to be the most difficult thing for us is to allow feeling uncertain, to allow feeling kind of, I don't know what to do, which brings up maybe, you know, feeling of hopelessness and helplessness from earlier traumatic conditioning in this life as, as little children, you know, for example, that feels intolerable for us. But if we, you know, train ourselves to be able to stay with those feelings, knowing that they are impermanent and doing it also as a Sangha, I think we can tolerate it together. And then, you know, seeing if we allow it to sink in and change us, you know, on some level, then what's the response which comes forth, you know? And it's, it's uh, you know, that willingness to feel, that willingness to be with the experience, which is often quite uncomfortable. And usually, you know, if our minds are not trained, we have a tendency to split off the energy and split it off into the head and then keep thinking, thinking, worrying, you know, and so on and so forth, putting the lid on it, getting depressed and feeling stuck, you know. And the way to open up that that stuck stuckness is to feel, to feel and to allow that feeling to open up. And you know, and if there is a feeling of of defense and numbness, to respect it, but be conscious of it, respecting the numbness, respecting the fear not you know trying to push it away not trying to pretend it's not happening but making it also part of what is present and then through that acceptance and allowing of the numbness of the fear of the defense and seeing what happens you know because that's also part of what's What's a natural response when there is a lot of uncertainty? Fear is uh, just a natural response. Makes a lot of sense, you know? Numbness. Because when we were little children, that was the only way how we could deal with the situation. If nobody was taking care or helping to take care of our fears, we had to just blank it out. That's the only thing we could do then. And some of those habits are still there, you know? But if we can make them conscious, then slowly but surely, you know, they will start to melt away. Because in order to be able to respond, in order to be a responsible citizen, let's say, you know, we need to allow the information to spread out through our being. And that can only spread out through allowing to feel, even if it's, it's, it's scary. And that's definitely something I have really no doubt in, you know, Vedana being the second foundation of mindfulness. That's why the Buddha gave it such a prominent place in his teaching, you know, the four foundations, the four establishments of mindfulness, body, feeling tones, 
mind states and conditionality, those four, you know, they are in the four establishments of mindfulness in the four Satipatthana because they are of such great importance in order to open up the process. So, you know, this crisis we are in together, this crisis of Homo sapiens, you know, which is kind of a little bit like a, an illness to the planet at this point, is what we are dealing with, you know, not because we are bad or not because we are wrong, but I think because we are just an immature species and that's okay, you know, every species species has to go through those different development stages like a child you know we are many people think you know we are as a species we are in an adolescent stage right now you know where we are wanting to have all of the privileges but not any duties or responsibilities and we're starting to wake up it's not working that way and it's it's actually you know, a non-brainer. Of course, it is not working. And now we can we can choose to move on. And you know, that's I think and it's also such a beautiful um, opportunity, you know, for practice. And at the same time, it's a service also, I think, you know, a service to our communities, a service to our families, service to our friends, a service to the whole species, a service to the whole uh, planet in a way, you know. It's, it's, a, it's something very enriching, I think, if we see it in that context. And in case, you know, it doesn't work out, then we can, you know, be a good compost for the next species of homo which might emerge out of us, which is also okay. And I always, you know, like to speak about the earthworm practice Ajahn Chah has been speaking about, you know, earthworm practice in the sense of uh, constancy in practice. And just, you know, being willing to be with what is and taking that in. And, uh, you know, like an earthworm, the earthworms, they don't know where they're going exactly. You know, they're just going to go forward. They don't give up, you know, they go forward, they keep on, you know, digesting and then releasing. And through that process, you know, they keep the soil aerated and the soil is able, you know, to produce food and doing a lot of good things in that very humble task of constantly being with what is and not kind of trying to escape and, you know, go to Mars or terraform Mars or go to another planet. No, they're just here and doing their job, just like us, you know, we can be just here and really meeting, meeting the moment and doing that as a, as a service also for, for life on this planet, really. As long as we are here, as long as we are, have an incarnation as a human being, you know, we very clearly feel through the gravity, you know, we are here on this planet, we are belong here. And as long as we are here in this way, we need to practice within the limitations of this planet. And that's a very clear, you know, um, situation. And we can uh, really use the practice to work within those limitations and wake up and grow up at the same time. You know, waking up is, uh, you know, really realizing emptiness or not self and one day, you know, stepping out of samsara and at the same time also growing up, which means, you know, really facing the challenges of our time and contributing rather than, you know, trying to turn away and trying to get out. Because I think the realization of... Uh, emptiness and the realization of not self you know one way how enlightenment can be in, um, defined needs to happen within the framework of the present moment and what's happening in the present moment is 
just what I uh, Vimala spoke about, you know, that we are considered to be an illness to the planet. And I think we need to take responsibility for that. That can be our practice. And we don't need to drown in it because it's not our individual kind of duty that we need to be the great heroes who rescue the planet, but just, you know, doing our bit, which means opening to the truth of that. And uh, I feel very, you know, kind of inspired to speak about those things. That's also why I've been creating the Aloka Earth Room, because I think it's such a great opportunity to feel really connected to something much bigger than ourselves and to receive the energy on which moves through this huge process and we can align ourselves with it and, and, and surf it, you know, as an earthworm. In a humble way, you know, the word humus or soil and the word humility, they have the same root. It's about, you know, coming down, coming down to the ground from the heights of patriarchy, you know, of wanting to transcend all of the messiness. The messiness is part of the game, you know, if you're a human being, we need to open to it and we need to allow it to be what it is. And at the same time, you know, to keep a sense of perspective and not drown in it, the middle way. That's why the teaching is called the middle way between the two extremes, you know. And uh, I personally feel very enriched, you know, by seeing the path within a framework of service. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hand over again to Ayavimala to lead us in a guided meditation so we can have a personal experience of that interbeing which Thich Nhat Hanh so beautifully describes how we can, you know, really get a felt sense about this deep interconnectedness, this deep, deep roots we have into the planet as planet, seeing our bodies as, as part of the biosphere, as part of the planet and not separate from it. So thank you. Thank you, Aya. Okay, so we have a half hour of guided meditation. And after that, there's some opportunity to ask questions. So to start, just sit comfortably. And take a few minutes to go over your body just to see if you're really comfortable. You can just scan through your body to see where there's areas where you're a bit tense, where you can relax a little bit more. Pay some special attention to your shoulders. There's often a lot of tensions accumulated there. Maybe you need to move a little bit, sit a little bit different. Position your arms a little bit different in your lap. Just try things out.
And also see how your facial muscles feel. You scan your face and see if you can relax all those muscles in your face. If at any time during this guided meditation you just feel uncomfortable about the meditation, then just feel free to not do it or to do something else. Just imagine to you sitting there is just imagine your skeleton sitting on the chair or on the floor. Slowly scan your body from the top down. And how does that feel? What does it look like? Your beautiful skull. It's giving you some stability. What does that feel like? Just investigate. Can you imagine what your skull looks like inside your body, inside your head? It's protecting us. It's so important to us. And the spinal column going all the way down along our back. All the way down up to our tailbone. Shoulder bones, 
Schilder blijft. All the ribs that are protecting your heart and your lungs. What does it look like? In the arms, the upper arm bones, the lower arm, and the hands. So many little bones in the hands that allow us to grasp things, to hold on to things. It's quite miraculous, really. Can you feel the hardness of the bones? The color? And you beckon. Such an important part of her skeleton. It's giving us this ability to walk, to move. The side bones. The knees. The two bones in the lower legs. your heels and feet. Again, so many bones in your feet. It's allowing you to walk upright. Can you imagine this whole skeleton sitting here on your chair or on the floor? And take a few minutes just to be with that skeleton. And feel that skeleton with love and kindness. It's such a wondrous thing.
And now imagine that the skeleton is lying in front of you and you're watching it from above. And slowly it falls apart, disintegrates, becomes dust. And the wind comes and picks up the dust and scatters it to all directions, on the fields, in the water, in the forests, in the deserts. And it becomes part of the soil, this beautiful earth. It becomes part of the water. and plants sprout up on that soil. And all these particles become parts of the plants. And the animals come and eat the plants and drink the waters and maybe other humans as well. And all this loving kindness that you've put in your skeleton earlier on is being spread to all these beings and plants wherever they are. To suffuse every part of yourself with loving kindness. And it will become part of this beautiful cycle of life.
It's like we have received this beautiful gift from other beings. All the molecules in our body have been parts of other beings before. And thanks to them, we can be alive and we can be here and practice. You can bring in that loving kindness in that cycle. And pass that on to all beings. I'll be silent now for about 10 minutes. And leave you with this contemplation and this meditation.
We're coming near to the end of the meditation. I take a few minutes to reflect back. How did it go? What did it feel like? And finally, we share the merits of our practice with all suffering beings in the world. Above, below, and all around, 
May all beings be happy. May all beings share in the merits of their making throughout practice. And also don't forget this being in the middle. And say to yourself, may I be happy. May I be happy. May I be happy. Thank you, Aya. And, you know, maybe it's good to take in, you know, that, that community that, you know, we are not kind of the only ones, you know, with all of those bones, but we are like a whole uh, community, you know, who share the same conditions in many ways. And you know, this is a time where where we can uh, rest, you know, into that what we all share. And you know, we all uh, have that opportunity, you know, to train our minds and our hearts and and our bodies to connect with something much bigger than ourselves. You know, not only for our own benefit, but also, you know, even, you know, to uh, join forces, you know, with the next uh, evolutionary step, which we might make, you know, as a species or not, but we can try. And we can, you know, support that by opening ourselves to this truth of uh, emptiness or not self, you know, which is the central insight of the Buddha's teaching and which has been a new teaching, you know, the Buddha was teaching it for the first time about 2,600 years ago. And since then, you know, modern science has been uh, coming to the same uh, results. And we still, you know, we still don't live from that truth, but we can uh, individually try to work on it. And, you know, if any of you have a comment maybe, or like to clarify something of what we said, it's a good time. If you wanna on Zoom, wanna come in, please, you know, raise your Zoom hand. And people sitting here, you can just uh, raise your physical hand. Joseph. Joseph has to speak loud, okay? Oh, they have a microphone even, great. Yeah, so the people on Zoom can hear. <laughs> here. Um, I was just thinking when you were giving the talk a little bit about, you know, being made up of um, skeletons of other creatures that have, you know, become gone, broken down to elements. I've been watching a lot of these videos about how, you know, even more than that, when you look out into space, that's all our elements and we got them all from there. And 
you know, we're still a part of that. And it's been fascinating. And I've heard some people say, and this is a little controversial, depending on which Buddhist circles you run in. But I've heard some people say that circle that you're talking about of breaking down and consuming elements and all that. Perhaps that's the rebirth that the Buddha was talking about. And maybe he wasn't talking about some essence transferring to another human body to another human body. Um, but maybe that was the actual process. And I thought, just ask you what you think about that. Let Daya speak first. Yeah, let I speak first. Yes, I come from an early Buddhist uh, tradition, an early Buddhist uh, um, Sutta tradition. And there the Buddha says very clearly what birth is. And that birth is a coming into being of the various uh, orders of, of beings. So uh, through birth, through a womb or uh, through an egg or uh, the spontaneous uh, birth of spontaneous coming into being of the, the devas and, and uh, these kind of beings. So uh, there is, it, it's, he says very clearly that that's what's meant by birth. Um, but of course you can, uh, if you find it, it helpful to do, it, it doesn't really matter of how the Buddha uh, defined that in this kind of context, because our, yeah, all the, our, our body is not the whole for us. There's also the mind. And we're at the moment, we're just focusing on, on the body and how that recycles, basically, or how every molecule recycles. Um, and yeah, that's just one reflection that you can use. And if you find it helpful, yeah, then it, it doesn't particularly matter if you see that as some kind of yeah rebirth of every molecule of your body. So you can also look at it that way. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably also you know in the Tibetan tradition they speak about you know a Buddha in every molecule. You know, like the you know all the whole body is made of immeasurable amounts of Buddhas. You know, and every 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 molecule water and so on and so forth that's just another way how how you can see it in the end of the of the day it doesn't really matter in that sense or in the vajrayana to speak about you know that all beings have been your fathers and mothers or mothers um, mainly that they're saying it you know that's the same way of, of saying the same thing and then i think what in early buddhism they speak about the six realms you know where you can be born as a, in a hell realm, animal realm, human being, um, Asuras and Devas and hungry ghosts. So that is one way of looking at it, but that's not really, I think, what, what, the, what the most important insight is. The most important insight is, you know, that as long as the mind is grasping, it will find you know something to hold on to and and then it will be born in some manner and and that's that's uh, endless until the mind has let go of and is no longer being sucked into some kind of rebirth if it's you know in what in what manner the rebirth happens is important you know because of the suffering which goes along with it but it's some manner of that Thank you so much for that. It really, this really resonates a lot with me. Um, and uh, you kind of like started out with this chemical geophysical description of calcium and carbonate and lime. And, and then we go into the ancient um, meditation of carnal grounds, maybe that part of that. And so oh, I'm into uh, remote sensing and getting data from electromagnetic you know information I'm, I'm just wondering like without getting too obscure but i would really appreciate it if there were a particular pseudo or 
practice or something like that that actually reveals kind of whether or not there was a, a concept of the electromagnetic field and force and the relationship of that um you know almost like the radiance of something and something else absorbing it or giving it off again that would be interesting for me um but short of that <laughs> um you know if 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 you do feel that you want to be part of this evolution um is there a particular suda or or a step that you should take first but especially like learning on your own when you all aren't here is there a suda or something that you would start with thanks i mean i would start with the Patana. you know i would start just with the basic template for meditation so that you get an understanding of who you really are you know that you actually just you know there's no no unchanging core to all of this and i think that's the most important um place to start you know to kind of refine the mind and to 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 kind of get a clearer um, and to get a capacity you know to, to really be with your present moment experience and that kind of sheds hopefully some of the assumptions and through that through it's it's not an accumulation of something you not already have but it's a letting go of all of the conditioning so that that what's really happening becomes clearer you know so that would be the first thing is to be clear about that you're not gonna gain anything you're just gonna lose hopefully a lot you know and and to get an interest in that is is kind of counter intuitive isn't it because we, we always think we we need to get something in order to be more wise or more compassionate and so on and so forth so you know to reflect on that and then get some basic instructions in in, in buddhist meditation yeah for satipadana then the, the four brahma viharas you know that's really the driver's license you know you need to have in hand in order to go anywhere with all of this you know and then the rest it kind of takes pretty much care of itself in many ways, you know, because then with the clearing out of a lot of this stuff, you know, your priorities might also kind of change, you know, and then there is no more need for too fancy theories of anything because you see that you have enough on your hands already. You don't need more, you know. I think that's what I would say. And you are... Yes, I just wanted to come back to your first question. It's like um, these terms like electromagnetic field and molecules, which I was using, they didn't have that in the time to go there. They had a very different kind of system, uh, which is basically based on the four elements. And that doesn't mean that if you put those four elements together, you have a human being or something like that. It's, it's, it's more like um, the, the qualities that these four elements embody. So you have like earth is like solidity and hardness and things like that. Um, fire stands for temperatures like we all have uh, temperature everything has a temperature in, you know and things like that so that's how they would describe the world in their system in their way and that's what the Buddha is talking about so you could also look into suttas that just look into it's like how, how do I look at this body from that perspective of just these four elements um, uh, and yes, the Satipatthana Sutta is, is a very good way of, of it. It starts off with the uh, looking also at the body in, in different ways, in different perspectives, um, looking at it from, yes, is this perspective of, well, what is this body? What's in this body? Um, uh, is there anything there that is, I can see as, hey, this is me. And then you come to a platform, no, actually I can't. There isn't anything particularly there that's me. It's it's just all a part of nature. And um, so the, the Satipatthana Sutta is a very good one for that. And the elements meditation is one of those. The elements ed ed meditation mm -hmm. is one of those. Yes, exactly. Elements, body parts, and reflection on death. You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Just a quick comment. Uh, Carl, do you want to come here? You can do it, Carl. You can sit down there, Mike. Uh, just, just a quick comment. Um, I just loved that. I had never heard the uh, simile or metaphor of the earthworm, and that mm -hmm. was just incredible. I just imagined myself just, I mean, because life is kind of like that. You're just kind of plodding along, right? yeah. <laughs> and you don't really know where you're going in a sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was just fantastic. Thank you. It's Ajahn Chah actually brought that up for the first time, yeah, because it's more like about the young... Uh, you know, put your head down, put your hand nose to the grindstone, I think they say here in America, you know, and just keep moving, you know. And not and and if there's resistance coming up, making it part of the practice, not about pushing it down, but just noticing it and also allowing it to be what it is, because it's here. Sandra, did you want to say something? Yeah, hi. Um Hi. Sometimes you you think of things and you discuss them and I don't know if anybody else gets them and you start to think, well, maybe I'm in a bubble. And so it was really nice to hear that the expression that a uh, society can, society can be in its different phase of development, just like a child. And it's... I sometimes they've you know I've taught children and you see progress and it's so true we have mixed messages about the environment and it's really our leaders who need to bring us to that next stage of understanding no i think you know we need to either we you know it, it looks like we need to no longer wait for some big uh, man to tell us uh, our leaders women or men i think we need to also take really responsibility because mm -hmm. the system is just so you know corrupt because of you know because we're just all human beings you know and we do the best we can and i feel to wait you know for somebody else to bring us somewhere i don't i mean I don't think that's working either, you know. I think we need to do the best we can, you know, do kind of our voting rights, you know, to kind of vote for the right leaders. But then we also, we can't just sit back and let them do this thing. We need to also do our own work, I really think, you know. Agreed. Yeah. I think that's really important because, you know, it's just, uh, I think it, it you know, if a certain amount of the population understands what we have been speaking about to really deeply understand you know then things will shift and 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 we need to all try to you know be part of that those people we are you know we are the ones we have been waiting for it. i really like that saying you know or sometimes it's called you know the immune system of the planet you know those uh, people who have enough understanding so that they feel a natural motivation you know and naturally live from that place you know and embody it and that will be very attractive also to other people you know who have still have a doubt and still are not stable enough in the recognition of it but they will feel intuitively kind of attracted you know because there is a kind of realness you know being lived which is very attractive you know that's when you when you see a teacher or when you see somebody who really has who, who really lives the practice that has a certain magnetism you know which nothing else needs to be said or done you know it communicates just by in a different manner you know and and some leaders have that and others don't, you know. And 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 uh, yeah, the leader system, you know, this is very much also like a part of the old uh, world, uh, the patriarchy, you know, like the big father figure who is going to tell us what to do and take care of us. It's not uh, so uh, kind of, it hasn't really been uh, that successful you know i feel that's also no longer something we can uh, just you know 
uh, give our responsibility away in that way? Yeah, I don't like the idea of giving away my responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I, but I would like to see more people in leadership positions take on that responsibility. Yeah. And be the kind of um, teacher that we need because there is so much influence with power, as we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, but how do kind of how do this is all like very you know this is all very theoretical and uh, and in hard to kind of uh, you know have a strategy how to ensure that this happened this way, but to really you know work with ourselves and see you know what how that also will uh, have repercussions you know mm -hmm. that's something we can do. I, I agree with with mm -hmm. that it begins with our children. Mm -hmm. We need to plant seeds so that they can grow along the path of responsibility planted to each other. Yeah. I think you shouldn't um, underestimate the power that each one of you has because if you make steps in the past and you change that will have an influence on other people even if you don't directly tell them what to do with something people notice that and feel that and see that and feel drawn into that so the more people do that it has it really has an effect on, on the rest of the society so it's, it's it's up to each of us to develop ourselves within ourselves and that will uh will make the change eventually Wendy. Just gonna say that I you need to oh thank you. Um I was just gonna say that in this incarnation I don't have physical children, but I still walk by everybody on the planet feeling like I have a responsibility for them mm -hmm. and that they have something to teach me. Mm -hmm. And so that is that joins those. And then I, I just wanted to briefly say in terms of the big man or anybody that we're looking to to accomplish these things that we need to check ourselves about what we're contributing to it. The last presidential election, there was a woman, Marianne Williamson, who was sitting there with a bunch of old Republican or old Democrats, but she was talking about spirituality in that forum. And that gives me hope that there is spirituality coming to these big planners of the planet. And, and I think the message is getting through. A little bit and she was not looked upon as a very beneficial um uh, addition to that forum but she's kind of held her ground and talked about love and was laughed at a lot um really there she was doing it so whatever anybody believes or if they know this person i'm talking about um it was a change in in a, in a democratic um what do we call those things when everybody gets a chance to talk uh, it, debate thank you that was the word i was looking for debate so it was a kind of a thing that's been happening since the beginning of our country and there was this woman who was saying i'm not going to do it the way you guys have been doing it for all this time so i was happy about that mm. thank you um is it okay if you go a little bit over time? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Are we done? No, no problem. Okay. Yeah. No, like, let's take another five minutes or so. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just want to say that mm -hmm. we're all leaders. Yeah. We really are. But it's really, really challenging to do my part, so to speak, by being, right? Um, I often get really, really overwhelmed. Um, and then I get kind of stuck and not quite sure how to, you know, move forward. It's it's pretty discouraging a lot of the times. So it's like, how how do I practice, right? How do I show up? And I do really well, and then I don't. <laughs> you know, and... Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure actually. Uh, 
But again, we're all leaders. It's it's on me. I need to do what I can do. It's my practice. But I get mm -hmm. often get really stuck, actually. But it's I think that's really part of the process. You know, we all have like good days and bad days, or mm -hmm. you know, good moments and 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 difficult moments where something gets triggered, and then. The practice is, you know, to be with that, whatever comes up. And if there's a feeling of stuckness, then you are with that, you know, knowing that there is, that it feels like this and, and not, you know, not trying to resist it, but being conscious of it. Yes. And to me, the presence of leaders, you know, where they're at the local level, and then she to like, oh, it's so just constantly feeling by you know. You know what I'm talking about in the presence of that. And then how to you how do I can be with that, but I think more needs to happen, right? Be with that. How do you both of my sad and sort of have some movement? Mm -hmm. But you know, if you feel uh, disgusted by it, so then I would just be really get taken an interest about what does that trigger in you, you know, because not everyone might feel disgusted in that moment. It's your experience, you know, somebody else might feel compassionate, you know, actually. Good for that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or somebody else might feel, uh, you know, hopeless or whatever. So to really take an interest in your personal what you bring to this and when when we can really be with that things start to open up that's that's my experience you know and then from that it becomes you know clear what what are the next steps and and community is important for that or you know or doing it with others sharing because then you know we learn oh you know somebody else has a completely different reaction and then oh you know what what do i bring actually to this to the what's what i'm experiencing and, and then tells us something about ourselves you know and that might have something to do you know with some early materials and so it's it's a you know it goes hand in hand the process of waking up and growing up Growing up is meaning, you know, to really kind of digest our patterns, you know, which can get activated in different ways. And and waking up would be to to stay really conscious in that process. And they they they're like intertwined, you know, like two hands, you know, working together. And uh, if the past is digested, you know, the future it opens up more widely because we are not so confined by the past. And and that digestion happens in the in those four establishments of mindfulness, you know, that we are practicing and looking at our own experience in those different ways and start to see that, oh, you know, they are impermanent. Whatever shows itself, those phenomena, they are impermanent, they are all unsatisfactory, and they are all empty of a self. And then through that, you know, it, more and more space opens up. The things still happen, but they happen in a much bigger space. And and that's how the luggage is, is left behind, you know, over time, over practicing. And then into that space, something else can emerge, you know, something which didn't have any space to go to before because we were so overwhelmed, you know, by, by all of those phenomena. And that's like something, you know, we need to do. I mean, we need to practice with it. And and that's, and we generally like to much more to speak about it, you know, because if you're practicing, we need to feel. And we all don't want to feel because it's so scary, you know. Yeah. And now we need to stop, Karen, and give you give you give it a little bit to you to speak. Oh yeah. Um, okay. And then I say two more sentences at the end. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm Karen. I'm a volunteer here. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you both for this very deep conversation about 
our place in this world right now. Um, the center is run on Donna. We're all volunteers here. So um, please give generously. It is part of the practice. And um, we have a little machine over there. Um, that takes cards, we take Venmo, we take PayPal. If you have cash, you can place it in that large wooden box on the desk. And uh, this month is, we're coming to the end of February. It has been a sustaining member month. So we've been asking people to become monthly donors to help us sort of pay the rent and keep the lights on. Um, so that's still happening. If you'd like to sign up to be a monthly donor, we've gotten like nine this month. So <laughs> it's very exciting. And um, yeah. Thank you all for coming. I can't, uh, I don't have the list of our programming, but we have another sit tonight. We have one on Monday, Wednesday, and stuff on Friday. So please check out our calendar and website. And I think that's all I need to say. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for being here. Oh, Tia is moving. I am. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the next, um, well, just specifically to thank both of you. So um, thank you to uh, I have a I have some to Chita. Um, the um, they'll be not them, but the uh, some incarnation of them will be back in a month. So in three twenty six. No, I'm sorry, that this, this is not correct because you know oh. I'm. Uh, usually it would have been Ayananda Bodhi coming back next month, but she needs to stay longer in the UK because of taking care of her mom and it will be too late in the night. And I'm already on a retreat next month on the East Coast. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, it needs to not happen next month. April. And April will be the next time. And it's, oh, it's no, going to I am on the body. Okay, probably yes. around Earth Day then. Should yes, yes, yes. When I have my open days at, at the Earth Room, I am on the body is going to be here in person. Okay, and when is your Earth Room opening? Uh, the opening, to... I have three open days, April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Oh, good. Earth you day. could all, you know, you could if you look it up on our website. And maybe, Tia, can you put the website into the chat? Alokavihara.org. Thank you so much. And, you know, alokavihara.org is the uh, website address for the Sana Loka Foundation, who supports Ayananda Bodhi and myself. And, you know, we have now two places. I live in the Aloka Earth Room in San Rafael, just north of the Gold Gate Bridge. And Ayananda Bodhi is living in Aloka Vihara in transition currently in Wales, looking after her mom. And then Ayananda Bodhi will be back in the spring and then uh, probably be in Berkeley for two months or so. And then we co-teach a retreat at Spirit Rock. And then after that, Ayananda Bodhi is going to go on sabbatical. Yes. Okay. And all of that, you know, you can look it up on our website. And thank you, Abimala, for coming. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, all of you, actually, it's, it's wonderful to meet all of you. And 